Hello, everybody. Um, so just a heads up, if I sound a little crufty, um, it's because last week I was battling a cold and just sinus mess, and don't worry, I was COVID testing the whole way through, and I uh, finally got through it all just to uh, get on an airplane and sleep with masks on and everything for you know, 15 hours, and all the crap came right back. So um, I'm still <laughs> working through that a little bit, and uh, so you'll just have to bear with me a little bit on this. So um, as was just mentioned, I, I work at Docker um, now, and I just started there about two months ago, so still uh, getting my feet wet and everything. But uh, prior to that, I was a Docker captain for about five years, and so I've been involved with the, the Docker community space for a long time now and done a lot of conference talks and and, while, and I, in fact, actually, the DockerCon two weeks ago, that was the first DockerCon that I haven't spoken in probably seven or eight years, which is just, or seven or eight sessions of DockerCon. So, um, but so what I'm going to be talking about today is actually my work that I did while at, <clears throat> while at Virginia Tech. Um, and while there, I did a lot of software development and cloud and containers and helping kind of modernize a lot of the ways that we were doing things. And... Uh, my last role there was uh, proposing, architecting, and then I led the creation of a common application platform, which is what uh, we're going to be talking about today. Um, you can find me pretty much anywhere online um, at Mikeser87 on Twitter and GitHub and all that kind of stuff too. So, um, so what are we going to talk about today? I'm going to talk just a little bit about this uh, common application platform because it sets the stage a little bit of what we're going to be working on today. And then uh, we're going to talk multi-tenancy. Um, because it's easier said than done, for sure. Um, then we're going to talk about creating our actual landlord, and then we're going to wrap up in Q&A. And the, the source code for this is, will be found here, and it's, it's already there, and we're going to be adding to it as, as we go throughout this session to you. So um, I'm very much a big believer in live demos. We're just going to build stuff and try stuff live. And uh, so hopefully the uh, conference Wi-Fi supports me. If not, we can fall back, and that'll work too. So. So first off, the goals of the effort. Um, this common application platform was really designed to be a, hey, you know, we, we recognize that there are many teams that are uh, deploying applications in many different ways at, at the university. Can we start to pseudo standardize this now that containers have, have really given us a, a higher level abstraction point? Can we have a platform that builds on top of that idea? Um, and so we, we wanted to, to build this platform and, and make it available to all of our application development teams around the university. Um, and at the end of the day, what we wanted was really to satisfy this. You, you build a container image, should be a build container image, but um, bring a container, we'll run it for you. And that was really what we wanted to do. Um, and one of the first things we had to do was identify kind of the separation of concerns. What does the platform team own and what does the application te uh, development teams um, own? And we pretty much decided that the, the platform team owns everything below the applications. And what I mean by that is uh, what we've got here on the, the slide here. Let me grab the laser pointer. OK, so the platform team would own any of the cloud infrastructure, networking, et cetera. Um, the cluster infrastructure itself, um, we built on top of uh, Kubernetes. Any co core cluster services, so obviously our like, ingress controller and um, Prometheus operators and, and, and all the kind of cluster-wide uh, services that are available. We would also manage all the node and compute resources. So our, our development teams shouldn't have to think about machine patching or um, anything that comes along with that. And then from there, we want to have an abstraction point where then the application teams can just say, here's my app, or here's my deployment, my service, my ingress, or whatever, and they don't have to worry about all the other glue that holds it all together. Um, and so with this kind of separation concerns, we basically kind of said, hey, if there's you know, new CVEs, new uh, security updates, if it was you know, with Kubelet or Kubernetes itself or a, you know, a machine node, okay, that's on us. If there's a problem with the application in which a REST endpoint isn't validating users correctly, well, that, that's an application concern. And so that's in this blue, blue box, and that's up to the application teams. Um, so we, we try to make it really clear on, on how this is, is going to work out. Then the kind of the question is: Is how do we actually how, how do we build this abstraction point? What what, what does that actually look like? And um, and we'll get in, into that in a second. So actually, maybe before I do this, I, I'd like to have a little bit of audience participation. Anyways, who's ever tried to do multi-tenancy in Kubernetes before? Okay, so maybe not quite a third. Um, who found it easy to do? <laughs> 
That's the, that's the reaction I expected there. Okay. Um, so the first thing I want to a- answer is, uh, what do I mean by tenant? Because uh, everybody's got different answers there. And we kept the definition really, really loose. And we basically just said, hey, application teams, you tell us how you want us to carve things up. And, and as we go through this, you'll see how we made various design decisions around, um, around the uh, kind of sandboxing around each tenant. Um, but really, it's up to the individual teams to, to figure out. We had some teams that said, all right, I want just a dev staging prod, and we'll throw all of our development in one, all of our staging in another one, and all of our prod in another one. OK, whatever. Um, we had other teams that said, I want a different tenant per application. And uh, again, we, we could support really any of them. To us, tenants don't cost anything. It's just extra metadata, extra policy, extra procedure, and that kind of stuff. Um, so again, we wanted to support our development teams and however they wanted to do development. And so <laughs> kind of going back into what, multi- what makes multi-tenancy hard is thinking about what could possibly go wrong. There's, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. Um, if you just start off by saying, well, we'll give everybody admin access and they can just deploy stuff anywhere, well, then how do you make sure that they don't step on each other's toes? Um, we don't want one team to make changes that affect another team, uh, whether that's to... Um, you know, change deployments or change ingress or, or whatever. You don't want one team accessing the secrets and config of another team. So there, there's just a lot of things that you've got to start thinking about. How do we properly isolate things? And, and there's, there are various aspects built into Kubernetes, you know, the RBAC and uh, role bindings, et cetera, that can help with that. But there's some things that it doesn't cover. So for example, if I allow teams to define an ingress object, how do I make it so that team A, you know, doesn't get their traffic intercepted by team B if they define an ingress that stomps on the host name of team A. Um, and so how, how do you just make sure, I mean, according to the RBAC, sure, everybody can create ingress objects, but how do you get a little bit more granular that, and we'll, we'll talk about some of that as well. As a platform team, we also didn't want to allow teams to create their own node port and, and load balancer services, but they should be able to create services. So how do we get more granular than that? And uh, we'll talk about that. And th- this is just, a quick list. There's so many more things that you've got to start thinking about once you start getting into multi-tenancy. Now, this isn't a fully comprehensive spectrum here. This is something I kind of just threw together, and uh, and and you'll see various opinions on this. When you start kind of diving into multi-tenancy, you'll hear the difference between soft and hard multi-tenancy, and really the difference is how much do you trust the people that are going to be deploying things onto your cluster. Okay? So as you go further onto the, the soft side, it's the more trust and the, you know, we, we trust everybody to behave well. Um, and for the most part, that's probably true. But again, we're in a university setting where we may be start working with students. And I don't know if I trust all those students out there. Um, and, or those students develop something and they, they've got it deployed. And now they've graduated, they moved on, and now some other professors having to maintain that, and they don't have any idea what's going on. So we had to think about, you know, where in the spectrum do we want to go? And as you move further over to the hard side of things, you start sandboxing and, do, uh, and basically removing a lot of the trust, uh, and you're putting more validation, and you're, you're putting just more constraints into place. Uh, it certainly makes things more secure, but also it does make sense things much more costly. So for example, if I'm doing a micro VM per pod, well now I've got, I'm running a lot more micro VMs, it's a lot more uh, resources that I'm having to maintain. But man, if anybody busts out of a pod, well they can't jump into somebody else's pod because well, they're in their own little micro VM at that point. And then there's some pretty cool stuff going on in virtual clusters, um, I won't get into that, but again, there's, there's a spectrum here. And for you and your organization, you kind of have to figure out where is it that you want to land, what's an appropriate level of constraints and controls, and also permissioning that we want to give back. So for us, we landed at about this point, where we didn't go to the full micro VM per pod, but we also wanted to support the ability to say, hey, we want to group various applications, various tenants together, maybe in their own node pool, and you know, have one node pool for this team and another node pool for another team. And again, we'll dive into that here in just a few minutes. Okay, so, as we start thinking about all these different things and all the different configuration points, we decided we're going to build something called a landlord. And why do we call it a landlord? Well, because we're in a college town and 
that's what most, you know, it's all apartments everywhere. And uh, it just fit the, the model pretty well. But when you look at an apartment and you think about a landlord that's having to manage it, uh, there's, there's a lot of things that they're having to keep in mind. Uh, first off, how many buildings do they have? Uh, how many floors are in each building? Uh, how big are the, the units? You've got some, some maybe studios, some you know, three or four uh, bedroom units. You've got lots of different sizes. You've got shared infrastructure in each of these buildings. So do you, you, know, do you trust everybody in the same building to, to utilize that shared infrastructure well? Or, or you say, nope, and I'm going to create another building and put these tenants over in that other. But, so it, it just matched the analogy really, really well for us. And just FYI, for those that are still staying, there's plenty of seats over here too, so feel free to cut over at any point as well. So for us, when, as we were thinking about the, the goals of the landlord, we wanted to, to have quite a few different things here. The landlord should allow us to define all of our tenants, but also be able, be able to do so in a way that's configurable. Okay, this, this tenant needs slightly different rules than another tenant. How, how do we set that up? Uh, we also wanted to be able to do everything declaratively and item potently. So if I def um, redefine all my tenant configuration, and if I add a new tenant and I re you know, uh, reapply everything, it shouldn't, shouldn't mess things up if, if I'm uh, making updates. Let's see. We should also support version control and history. And you know, it's actually kind of cool because as we're going through this, in many ways, many of these principles are exactly what we heard earlier today with the open um, GitOps principles that are coming out. And uh, no, I didn't have a sneak peek at that or, or whatnot beforehand, but it's, it's neat to see how these line up. The, the last point here was something that was pretty big on us because for the most part, our team didn't have a lot of developers um, on our core platform team. So the last thing we wanted to do was say, hey, we're going to create some CRDs and we're going to create a controller and we're going to have to like manage all this stuff ourselves. So we wanted to be able to define a landlord in a way that could utilize tools and things that we're already familiar with, with, again, not having to do custom programming and, and maintenance here. So as we did some research and after actually uh, deploying tenants a couple of times, we are like, um, Helm just solves all this for us. And uh, we'll, we'll see this here in just a minute. But it, it checks all the boxes for us that we're able to, um, you know, th theoretically create a chart that basically is our landlord and home chart, and then giving it a custom values that defines the tenants that we need. Then we can customize uh, each tenant based on on their specific needs. And with that, I'm, again, I'm a big believer of. Uh, programming on the spot here too. So we're, we're going we're gonna to build a landlord helm chart uh, together here. And we're going to walk through the process a little bit here. Okay, so first things first, well, every tenant needs a namespace. That Hopefully everybody at least knows that uh, at this point. Okay, you should give every tenant their own namespace. Um, so if we have a kind of values uh, YAML file here, this is just a sample. Um, I'm, I have a top level key of tenants and then I've got team awesome, team cats, and team dogs here. Um, and so just starting from here, I can have a Helm template that what it's going to do is it's going to do a range. So it's basically going to iterate all through all the tenants, uh, pull up the key value pairs, and I'm just going to basically create this namespace object once for every tenant. Okay, um, Pretty simple here. And let's actually just do that. So first thing I need to do is actually hey, create a new window here. And I'm going to create a new chart. So we're going to literally start this from scratch. Create a landlord chart. And I'm just going to remove most of the stuff that's in here. Oops, I did that backwards. Yes, get rid of all that. Okay, and let's clean that up to you. Okay, so where is I'm going to create a namespace YAML, paste that in, and I'm going to rename this to value sample tenants, team awesome, team cats, team dogs. And now, pull this up a little bit. If I 
uh, template this out, we'll see that, as, as expected, I've got namespace for Team Dogs, one for Team Cats, one for Team Awesome. Okay, so at this point, I've got a really basic Helm chart. I'm super on the soft side, and I would just assume I'm going to give everybody credentials to this, and hooray, I've got a you know, landlord or multi-tenant, hooray. Um, obviously, it's not a good setup, but um, let's go ahead and install this. Oops. I do that all the time. All right, so that's been installed. And if I look at my namespaces, I see my, my three team namespaces there. Cool. So let's, let's keep moving through our spectrum here. So the, 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 the next thing we actually have to ask is how are our tenants going to actually deploy things uh, into our, our cluster? And uh, it'd be pretty bad if I, I'm at GitOpsCon and I didn't say GitOps, right? Um, <laughs> otherwise, I'd be like, wait, why, why is he even speaking here? Um, <laughs> So yes, we, we did uh, decide to use uh, Flux for our, our tooling. We actually had an internal bake off, and uh, this was back Flux v1 days, and we did you know, Flux and Argo, and we had one team even just say, well, we're just gonna hand out credentials, which was a terrible idea, but, um, and, and so we went through the migration of Flux v1 to v2, and it's, it's been just awesome. Um, so what we did is, as a platform team, we would provide a, so any time a new tenant needed to be created, we would create a manifest repository for that tenant. Um, so we would create a repository. We would hand that to them and basically say, hey, you've, you've got maintainer uh, rights to this. And then whatever you put in there is what we're deploying. So we, we own those manifest repos, and then we kind of give it back to the application teams to, to do whatever they want with. Um, and so you know some app teams you know went through the full, full CI pipelines, we were a GitLab shop, and so they would take the GitLab um, CI and would clone that manifest repository, push new manifests into it, you know, commit, push it, all that kind of stuff, and, and have it as part of, of fully automated. And then we had other teams that were like, we don't trust any CI CD, and, uh, and so we're just going to make all of our changes manually, which, okay, cool. So for us, one of the, the big advantages is, is by using GitOps, Again, it allowed us to support all the different ways that teams wanted to, to deploy things. Um, we had other teams that wanted a little bit more change management process, and so, okay, cool, here's your, your manifest repository, and they went through like a whole pull request review process um, internal to their team. Again, we, as a platform team, we don't care how your manifest get updated, as long as whatever's in the main branch is what you want, well, that's what we're, we're treating as the source of truth. However it gets there, that's up to you. Um, and so that, that was one of the kind of really gratifying things for us as we started seeing more of our, our customers using this, that GitOps was the right choice here. Um, but in order to do this as a, as a platform team, there's, there's quite a few different things that we need to do. So for each tenant, we need to create a service account within that tenant namespace that has access to be able to create resources within that namespace. Um, this is really important so that you don't accidentally say, well, hey, in my manifest repository, I've got an object that's going to actually deploy something in somebody else's namespace. Um, by creating a service account within that ten tenant's namespace, it, it sandboxes them. It, it keeps them within their, their namespace. So even Flux can't apply things outside of uh, their namespace. Then we create a Git repository that fetches the source material and uh, create a customization that then applies the manifest. Um, so here's some quick little examples here. So for Team Awesome, um, we're going to, and, and again, this is some of the things that we can uh, adjust over time. We have some teams in their manifest repos, they just dropped on the manifest at the root, while others you know, had a whole directory structure, and, and, um, and so we wanted to be able to, to customize the paths for each of the different groups. So let's go ahead and plug that in here. So what I'm going to do first is let's get all the... Um, are back plugged in here. And so what this is going to do is it's again going to loop through all the tenants and I'm going to create a service account within that tenant's namespace and uh, I'm going to create a role binding that then says for that service account we just created, give it the admin cluster role access but since it's a role binding it's, it's giving them ad, admin access just inside that namespace. Okay? Um, and one of the reasons we did this is because there's a lot of other uh, and a third-party tooling cert manager being one, for example, that when they create 
Um, when they create cluster roles, for example, they, they're using the aggregate functions of, of Kubernetes so that now by having admin, I can create these other uh, ob objects as well too. So the, this was this is a good thing to do here. And then the other thing I need to just snag is flux. Oops. Our actual config objects here. And, and so in this case, we're going to create a Git repository and a customization. And in this case, again, for a platform team, we created a separate repository for each tenant. For demo purposes, I don't want to have to create tons of different repositories. And, and I also want each of you to be able to go take the source code and actually run with it without having to create tons of different repositories. So the, there is an, an adjustment here in which I'm actually saying, OK, the URL is this uh, GitHub repository. And then I'm changing the, the paths that each of our uh, tenants are going to be using. So path and team manifest. Awesome. Cats and dogs. OK, and so what this is going to do is once we apply this, in this code repository here, I've got a directory called team manifest, which basically is a simulation of those um, individual team repositories. And so in, in team cats, for example, if I open this up, I'll see a certificate. I'll see a deployment that's going to deploy just a, a silly little cats app that I've got, uh, define an ingress, et cetera. Okay? And, and same thing for these other uh, teams here. So again, this is just kind of a single repo simulation of um, what normally is across several different repositories. Now, if I, bah, 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 sorry, I apparently make a lot of sound effects when I'm coding. Huh? Um, when I do the Helm template now, I'll see the customization, and I'll, I'll see all that being property replaced in. So let's do an upgrade now. All right. And this is the only time in which I'm actually dependent on the internet, so hopefully it's working. OK, so the URL. Oh, is there one up here? OK. OK, it looks like it's working out. OK, I'll just hold that here just in case. All right, so we've at least been able to fetch the revisions. And if I look at the customizations, I'll see that they were applied. And so actually, if this worked, let's get a new window here. Cats, let's see. Let me drop out a full screen here. Cats, local. OK, and there's my app. OK, and so it just displays a random GIF. Hooray! OK, so the demo is working. Um, and it just keeps giving me a random GIF every time I refresh. So, um, And so if I go to dogs.local, it's basically the same app, but instead I get dogs now. And, uh, and so that, that tenant's working. So again, hopefully you see that just by figuring out how do I template out the, the tenant configuration, now I'm able to just kind of spit these out uh, very quickly. Um, OK. So let's talk about locking things down just a little bit here. Um, quick show of hands, how many people have used Gatekeeper before? OK, so there's, there's quite a few hands. I'd say about half. OK, so Gatekeeper, um, first off, the first thing I'd say is don't try to write your own policy engine. Uh, don't, just don't. Um, Gatekeeper, for those that aren't familiar, is a, basically a, a Kubernetes wrapper around the open policy agent engine. Um, so you use an OPA, or Open Policy Agent. You can write policies using a, a language called Rego. And then what Gatekeeper does is it wraps it around so then it's basically an emission controller. So as all requests are coming through the Kubernetes API to make changes to state, uh, whether to create a new object or delete an object, whatever, um, Gatekeeper can be notified. And um, you can basically add your additional policy. So remember earlier how I was saying, I want to allow teams to create services, but I don't want them to be able to create node port services. Well, so Gatekeeper lets me do that. I can write uh, policies and, and 
that as services are being created, will look against the policies and say, hey, should this thing actually be um, accepted or not? Okay, so one of the things that I want to do is, as a platform team, we created gatekeeper policies that basically satisfied all the pod security standards, that, at least the baseline um, level. So we didn't allow any of our tenants to run privileged pods or to mount the host volume, uh, host file system into the container, use host namespaces, basically all those kind of standard pod security policies. And so what we want to do is say, all right, landlord, you're in charge of making sure that all these policies are actually being defined. And again, I'm not going to try to make this a full gatekeeper uh, talk here, but once I've defined the policy, then I can create a, an object, in this case, a Kate's PSS baseline privilege container object, and, and then I'm going to apply it to all the namespaces that are being used by tenants. And so within these namespaces, it's not going to allow any privilege container to run. Okay? And then after that, then what we can do is we can have some parameterized ones. So again, going back to the idea earlier that we don't want to allow teams to, to take ingress names for which they're not authorized to use, well, that's just another gatekeeper policy at this point. Gatekeeper policies allow us to provide additional parameters to them to say for this tenant, you're allowed to use domains A, B, and C, while another tenant may be allowed to use X, Y, and Z. And, and so when the policy runs, it'll use those, um, those parameters as part of the, the uh, policy enforcement. And so for example, I've got Team Cats over here that's able to use cats.local.micsurie7.training here. Now if I, and the, the dogs, try to use this name, uh, assuming obviously it's, it's being cut off a little bit here, but that they, they wouldn't be allowed to use that. And so when the policy runs, it would um, prevent anybody else from using that domain name. And so Gatekeeper, again, being an emission controller, would totally block that from happening. So let's, uh, let's actually do this here. So in my Git repo here, and again, you're welcome to try this out. Let me close some of these out. I have a gatekeeper policy chart. One of, and one of the things I'll say to you is this is just a sample. Don't take this gatekeeper policy chart and say, hey, Michael Irwin said use this, and therefore we're now secure because we're using his policies. Heavens no, okay? Um, this is just a sample. But we can look at, just a, as an example here, that host uh, file system. When here's a, some of the rego in which we're gonna extract all the volumes out uh, from the, the object and we're gonna look to see um, if it has a field host path. So if it has a field host path, then hey, that, that's gonna be denied here and we're gonna prevent that from happening. So this chart just defines all those policies and all the rego. One of the things, uh, so most of these I inlined uh, directly into the object, but one of the things that we learned as a, as a platform team was it actually made a lot more sense to extract the rego out into separate files, uh, separate directories here. So we, for example, the authorized domain policy that I was just talking about, we have that extracted into a separate uh, file here, and the big reason for that was to be able to support CI CD so that anytime we make changes to any of our policies, our CI pipelines could actually run all of our tests for it. And then as part of the Helm build, it would just extract the file and inline it uh, into our Helm chart too. So there, there's an example of that happening here as well too, if anybody wants to dive into that. Anyways, okay, so let's go back to our landlord chart. Let's get all of our, um, let me grab, Okay, so I'm going to create a template called um, Gatekeeper PSS for Pod Security Standards, and it's just going to apply those, those Pod Security Standard objects. Again, this is only three of them. There's more to the Pod Security Standards. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to do is one more file, and this will be the authorized domains. And go over here and we will put domains cats.local training. Does that well we'll just do one tenant here. Okay, we'll do a home upgrade. And looks like I've got something dork done. 
Oh, whoops. Oh yeah, I had to make one more change here. Um, tenets. So one of the things that we, we did from the start is we would authorize domains for their tenant namespace dot some identifier. Um, and so in this case, what I'm going to do is basically say, hey, Team Awesome is automatically authorized to use Team Awesome dot tenants dot local dot microservice seven dot training. So basically, here's a default domain that you you can use, and you don't have to worry about um, anything else. And so we would put this within our own. Uh, cluster DNS and, and all that kind of stuff. So if teams just wanted to prototype things quickly, they could do that. Okay, now let's do our home upgrade. And what we should be able to do now is if I, I'm going to grab, back over here, and let's, uh, let's go to Team Cats, and I'm going to try to break this a little bit. And I'm going to try to just run a privileged pod here. And normally, I would, I would commit this, I would push it up and you know, get, let it go through the GitOps thing, but just due to time and uh, whatnot, I'll just do it manually here. Um, so team cats. And blah, 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 blah. Oh, whoops. That shouldn't have worked. <laughs> um, hold on, say that one more time. Yeah, that shouldn't matter. Um, wait. Oh, gotcha. I see what you're saying. I put that file in the wrong spot. Okay, so for those that didn't catch, I made the, the gatekeeper pod security file, and it wasn't in the templates directory, so I just accidentally had it in the wrong spot. It didn't, get, it didn't create that policy. Now, let me delete that first. Come on. <laughs> Okay, it's still being deleted, but anyways, now it will actually block it. Okay, so again, you will just want to kind of think about what policies you want, and then how can you plug it into your, your landlord to, to template it out. Now, one of the things I just want to mention real quick, and I know we're, we're short on time here, is breaking up workloads. And one of the things that we did is, again, using node pools, and um, you know, Kubernetes doesn't actually have a built-in you know, node pool thing. Okay, but you can use taints and tolerations, node affinities, node selectors to start building out node pools yourself and basically um, have that capability. So one of the things that we did was we, we basically said, all right, hey, we're going to create a node pool A here that has taints and labels that reflect team A, another one here that's team B, and then we're going to mutate pods that have the tolerations and the node selector to put the pods where they need to be. Okay? So node, or team A's pods will go to team A's nodes, Team B's pods will go to Team B's nodes, et cetera. Um, and there are a variety of different tools that we can do this, but um, we we quickly adopted Carpenter, uh, and we're a big fan of Carpenter, um, because Carpenter allows us to define all these node pools and the provisioners and everything using config. And and so if, as an example here, here's a provisioner that I can create the taints and, and put the, you know, the various taints and the uh, labels that need to be on those specific pods. And then to force the pods into the node pools, Gatekeeper also can be a mutating controller. And so what we would do is we'd say, hey, for this particular tenant, they're going to be on the node pool named demos. And so we would create a Gatekeeper mutation that for all pods that spin up in that particular namespace, um, they would have the node selectors and the, and the tolerations to put them into that pool. And so what that means is that as the application developer teams, they didn't have to know nor care that this was happening behind the scenes and um, was, was really powerful. So again, the teams didn't have to add these taints and tolerations and s node selectors and all that kind of stuff. We did it automatically for them um, just by running on the platform. And again, this was something we could script out and just put into our landlord. Just 
wrapping up here too, a couple other things that we did in our landlord. Uh, we we ran file beat in our cl cluster and we would s gather up all the logs and send them off to Splunk. Well, every team had different Splunk indexes that they wanted to use. So cool, we would just say, tell us the annotations that you want and we'd mutate those on as well. And um, and then so all pods that spun up in their their particular tenant namespaces would, would forward off. Uh, we also integrated our back with our, our IDP on campus as well. Um, and this is a pretty common pattern. We use a Kubo IDC proxy and um, kind of go from there too. So, And so one last thing, obviously in this demo, I was doing everything with just Helm install, Helm upgrade. Um, obviously you can use a Helm release and go that way. And this is the, the way that we, we definitely did it. One of the things I would uh, recommend is we would actually take that value sample in and deploy as a configs map and then using the Helm release uh, values from reference that config map and, and deploy uh, from there. And the big advantage for that is then we could take that config map, that raw values, and um, do a Helm template and, and render out just like we were doing here. So with that, um, GitOps is awesome, and the landlord has uh, helped us be able to scale up and down as tenants need and be able to you know, spin up workshops. You know, Great, we're going to do a workshop with 50 tenants in it. Great, we can just spin that up and go from there. And uh, with that, I thank you. Hey, at the forum, three folks are here. Can you get mic'd up? Thank you. Yep. Um, any questions for Michael? He, uh, we have like two minutes. Um, so about uh, like the poly like you say you use gatekeepers, basically like admission web hooks. So like I always like maybe it's like just like like in the GitHub's pattern thinking, right? Like I ultimately would block then the release of my my tenants that would use uh, a invalid configuration, right? Mm -hmm. So what's your preparation, like actually blocking the full sync yep. or allowing it into and kind of like, and then afterwards having a control understand, I cannot just take it and do something with it or I need to ignore it. Yeah, that's a good point. So <clears throat> one of the things that we did is we actually built a, a dashboard, um, a, a web-based UI where that the, all the tenants can log in. It was basically kind of set up for a more GitOps flow where the dashboard's fully read-only and here's your deployments and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things that we did was up in the top left corner, it would basically was a status of the customization. So it would tell you um, what commit had synced, was it successful or was it not? And so if you committed an, like an ingress object or a, um, that used a, a wrong domain or a node port service, you know, anything that invalidates, yeah, the customization sync would fail because the policy prevented it from being applied. But then we would have that right there on the screen and, and here's the, the error message you got from Gatekeeper and, and whatnot too. So, so yes, we, we did block that sync from, because the emission controller blocked it, but then we also gave them, here's the visibility on why it didn't happen. They didn't have to drop into the CLI to figure it out. Yep. Alrighty, and I think we'll, we'll switch over, but uh, if, oh, yes. Hi, uh, what is the real advantage of having a separate node pool for per tenant as compared to entire cluster? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. The we had a couple different reasons to do it. Um, some teams didn't trust other teams to be running on the same nodes with, with them, and so that, that was part of it, so how much cross-team trust was there? But also, we use separate node pools also as a cost accounting measure. So we would spin up each of the different node pools and put the cost allocation tags, uh, since we were running AWS, and then we could know, hey, this tenant is costing us this much to run workloads on, on our infrastructure. Oh, gotcha. Why not multiple clusters? Because we didn't have a big enough team that wanted to, to run multiple clusters. <laughs> yep. Awesome. All right. Thank you. All righty. Thank Appreciate you, everybody. It, Michael.